Hello, my name is Dr. Hendrik Thomas. I'm a senior product manager for Atlassian, and it's a great pleasure to talk to you today. Um, I'm a scientist, and my real passion in life is we need to bring data science closer to the product management domain. What I'm trying to do is to help you all build better products by making better decisions. The key here is really to find the evidence to back up your decisions. Your decisions are, don't need to be, no longer be need on, to be based on hunches or a very loud customer, but really based on objective metrics and numbers. So you can actually start a much more deeper discussion with your colleagues, with your peers, and with your customers and understand the, where the gaps are. It's really data-driven. In order to do that, we'd like to talk today about a scalable, scalable approach for product discovery, because the employee perspective is so hot right now. The idea is really to focus on the the pain points of the customers. And the problem is that most SaaS products really and traditionally have really focused heavily on the admins or the manager perspective or even the people who are paying the bill, but really left a bit of focus away from the users. And we know in order to make a really good product, you need to have focus on adoption, the people who are using it. And the focus on customer discovery, product discovery, which are really going hand to hand is something, nothing really new. Most products have done it quite successful like Google or Apple. But it's the customer discovery really means still different things to different people. It's not really the what, we understand that, but really the how to adopt that and really make it a scalable process, that's a challenge. And as a scientist, when I'm confronted with a difficult challenge, I'm trying to look for a model that helps me to explain what I see and predict certain behavior patterns. And I think in this case, I actually found a model that could be quite useful to explain the situation. The model I found here is a model called the Gartner Hype Cycle. This is a really interesting model that helps to explain and predict how new technologies or idea emerge, are continuously adopted, and until they're really finally accepted. You can explain the way how credit has come to be, modern um, iPhones and digital devices, or just new ideas. They always go through these cycles, and they're quite useful to predict this and give people a tool in your hands to see what happened and to explain and predict what the next couple of steps are. And this is actually quite useful for your own product development. So try to make a note of it and see how you can use it in order to explain your own private product development. But coming back to the model, the model starts with an innovation trigger. And always at the core, you have a pain point, something that is so painful that you need to change. Some process needs to change in order to reach your customer or create the objectives you're trying to achieve. Then a new technology, a new idea comes along. And you're going up with more and more expectations because you have initial wins and the idea sounds good. And these initial wins further balloon the inflated expectation until you reach the peak. And then inevitable, you're crashing down. Crashing down further through the trough of disillusionment or, why, or how I call it the Oshaise moment because all these expectations can't be fulfilled so quickly. You understand, you identify certain challenges and the adoption slows down and it's just harder to get the value you, you were promised quick enough. But here's the point where you need to keep going. Slowly over time, more and more people adopt the new technology idea, more and more win stories coming across, and you basically um, work out the kings and you actually understand a better operation model. But more and more and more, you see how people find value in it until at some point it reaches the plateau of productivity, where it's really mainstream, and the whole thing becomes adopted by everyone and the value is realized by everyone. And I believe from a scalable product discovery approach, this model can actually be used quite nicely to show the different stages you have to go through. Let's start with the pain point. As a product manager, and it applies to every product manager, you know you can't get, build good products if you get feedback only rarely and not from the users themselves. So the discovery you do often doesn't align with the product vision where you want to make well, the most amazing product. It just doesn't work together. And the reason for that is that in the moment, customer research, product discovery with your customers, often very manual process. It's very time consuming to write down your notes on, on paper or on the confluence page and you put it in the email. And because it's so complex, you focus your energy, you focus on single problems. You often focus on the export button or feature, the button or the background color. And in almost all cases, because of the restriction, they are focused on a single product rather on the experience itself. And as a result, because you can't, it's so time consuming, you do few of them. So you, certain anecdotes, 
certain customer they're very loud they're really overrated and overshadow everything else just because they're so they had been lucky to be included in a group and most of all in many cases because of access problems you don't talk to the users directly particularly in the context of SaaS products you just talked about the admins or people who are buying and, and the product so as a proxy so you're cutting out a lot of people who are actually using them shouldn't give you the feedback directly so you have a really big pain point. So you're trying to change that but getting better information about the true pain points from your customers. So, and now we're coming to the next stage. If that's the pain point, what's the solution? And the solution for the model that helps you go up the expectation scale is a scalable directed discovery model. So what does that mean? What do I mean with that? First of all, the directness. What's the directed discovery model? This is something which I think intercompiling. And the idea is here really that you have to make a change in the way you approach customer discovery, really focus on problems and values. And to do that, you need, first you need to understand that, that customer discovery is not equal to customer interviews. What it means that we have actually three different types of customer discovery that each need to be run separately in a different way, but also to de deliver you different insights. The first group of type of interviews you do as a called VOC, voice of the customer. Here the mission is really to talk to your customers and let them speak about their generic pain points, everything from a broad perspective. Let them talk, bring the emotion up in order to really understand what the underlying problem space are, what works, what doesn't, what's missing, and really from the end-to-end -end flow. The more they talk, the better. This is really going deep and you shouldn't restrict yourself on product suite. Just let them talk across their experience. Once you have that, you get usually a good understanding of pain points, broad ones. And this is the step where you step over and talk to your engineering leads about solution. Come up with some ideas um, as a wireframe, something, whatever you have, or a small prototype. And then you shift over to customer preference testing, which is very different in nature because you have an idea how to address the pain points and you give it in the hand of the customer. You give in typically a prototype and a short steps of instruction, a bit of context. And then you, it's important that you shut up. The idea is here that the customer go through this proposed solution and you have to observe. Capture the customer preference, what works, what doesn't. You almost want them to fail because you want to see where the edges are, what the limits of your ideas. Again, very different because you validate one specific solution approach against the pain points. And then at the end, you start building it. And after you build it, you do CCT, customer confirmation testing. Here, it's really about showing an end product to a customer to see if you have the mark or if you missed something, if your small things are optimizing. But it's already late. It's already built and you just optimize. So the first thing from the session you should take away is if we have these three different types of interviews or interview styles, if you want to call it, that get, deliver you different insights, voice of generic pain points, validation of an idea, or confirmation that what you build is good enough, Ask if anyone presenting you with a customer feedback from another team, ask, okay, cool, that's great feedback. What type of discovery did you do? Which category did it fall? And if they can't really answer saying it's a bit of all of them, they've already failed. So really question that and bring it up. This is the directness of the model. And then we need to talk about scale. Just saying, hey, I've done five interviews. Do you really want to do more? That's a terrible question to ask you. The idea is really not about the number, it's about the the coverage you do. That's why we need to do is a research plan. This is an example of a very simple research plan. What you're trying to do is to get the pain points and understanding from the entire customer base. So you need to slice and dice. So you need to make sure that you don't have gaps, meaning you need to talk about different locations, different customer sizes, the industries. So you make sure when you, for example, talk about sizes that you talk with companies for your customers that are smaller and larger because their pain points can be different. So you need to make sure that you're Research and yet people you talk to is really spread across so you don't have gaps. For example, in this case, many cases, you find the persona, the employee, a problem to approach because you're simply not allowed to talk to them. So this is a gap, but you need to call that out to understand that we're basing our decision on something, but here we have a gap. So scale it up, not in the sense that you have to 100, 1,000 interviews, scale it up in a way in sense that you actually know the different markets you have and slice and dice to make sure that each one is covered. So knowing that now, we could do it, we could build it, and then it will come. This insight will come. It's, it, it's very simple. We just do more interviews, make sure that we talk to the right people and make sure that we have the right category of interviews, and we should be sweet. The problem here is you're not. 
all you end up with is a research calendar with lists and lists of interviews, recordings, and then the pain starts because you need to digest that. Scale is not just about running the interviews, which is time consuming, but also processing. This was my best attempt in a wiki page, which I love Confluence, but in the end, it's just a flat page and it gives you information like insights, opportunities, risk, quotes, very nice structure, but utterly useless because you're creating these pages bit by bit. You, each interview creates one of these inside pages, but they can't really connect it. They can't be crossed. It's really hard to link one feature, one point of feedback to the next one. It's almost impossible with flat farms. I think that's the limit where you simply can't deliver the value. The insights that are hidden in here can't be extracted. And this is exactly the trough of the delusion. You're failing to realize the potential. You have the data, but you can't extract the pain points to use you to prioritize and build your roadmap. That's the fault. And the next steps, I want to show you about seven different steps, seven different recommendations. How do you go up the slope and enlightenment? The first of all, before we go into any technical recommendation, it's really important to understand what the principle of feedback management is. And here it's really about culture change. Again, this is about, again, I want to highlight this. We need to focus on problem spaces and values we deliver our customers. That's the key. And the three things to be mindful. First, every bit of feedback you get, and that's the outcome of the discovery model. Every discovery interview, you get feedback. And you need to make sure that this feedback is treated as a gift. Every feedback point helps you grow your understanding of the customer context, pains, and opportunities. So treat it as it. Be thankful and use it wisely. Second, each feedback point is timeless. Don't limit yourself for the current needs. Think big. Go wider from your problems. Don't limit your to a feature or something. Take everything in there and store it and make it accessible because you could use it in one a year, in a year or two years' time because the pain points typically don't go away just as the solution change. And so in order to understand that, you can have these timelines and you can build back. Some have still looked back for two years and the problem hasn't been solved, particularly big ones. So treat feedback as something that is not lost and can deliver value over time. The last one is probably the most important. Every bit of feedback you're getting is biased by its nature. It's given by a customer to you in a certain context. So you need to be mindful. It's, it's not diagnostic. You need to understand the context, to understand what the bias is. And also be aware that negative feedback, ne negative feedback is actually quite rare. Let's assume you have a million users and only 1% complaints. It's still a very small number. There's a huge number of people still complaining, but don't express it to you. Don't send your uh, support ticket. They'll just be unhappy. So treat this negative and positive figure as very important because you just don't get the broad volume, get only a snapshot. So they are really important and you help to understand. It's important to understand why this was given. So again, coming back to bias. So these features and um, these principles help you see and understand what feedback actually means. So the first recommendation you have to do here is to get away from these notes. So many interviews are condensed in a couple of bullet points. Forget that, scrap them. Focus on the real data and use tool to make them accessible. What I recommend is really about automating a process and archiving this raw data, make it accessible for the long-term use. Use Zoom, use Vegabex, do a recording, and the next step is use an automated transaction script. Otter, for example, is a very nice one, online AI tool, where you just extract it and you get full text. Put it somewhere in a wiki, make it or another storage or in a Google Doc, so it becomes accessible. You can search the entire conversation by text. It's a massive amount of text. Trust me, it can be daunting. But this is the first step to really unlock the value that is hidden. Therefore, raw data and get a full transcript. And now with modern technology, it's actually quite cheap to do, not very complex. That shifts us up to the slope enlightenment. What's the first step for everyone? What else can we do? The next thing is the key thing. It's the power of one. The idea is that we have one place where everyone contributes all their interviews in one space. And then the key thing is that we have different feedback points and can link it to end problem. One bit of feedback, maybe an email, can be linked to multiple problems and multiple features. This one-to-end relationship can't be done in a single wiki page. I've done it, I tried it, it, it doesn't work. You need proper tooling to relate one feedback to end problems. Product board or dovetail are typical tools you can use that designed to do that. On the bottom right, you have this dovetail version where you see a text that was written, we extracted, and you can see how you hide a different section and can link it to different features or problem space, like progressing 
processing work. And um, product group does it very nicely as well. You can see who did feed feedback and you can link it to features and back. And this is the key for scalable product. You need to go through the entire text of the interview, assign these different domains or different features to them. And then you can go back and see a flip back approach. You can see what feedback did I get for a particular problem. Very useful, but requires tool. And choose one for the company or for at least for your team. So everyone have access, you can share, collaborate and bring everything together. The next thing is that feedback is not only custom interviews. They are a great session, but there are many different ways you get feedback. And the difference to understand, some feedback is very detailed, but hard to get. Others may be a bit shallow, but plentiful. Use both dimensions. So as I said, the green ones, the customer interviews are most common. But think about emails from a customer directly. Talk to your salesperson. Praise who offer a question. Great. Then we have more public spaces like rating pages, trust radio, someone who gives a rating about your company. They're often a bit mixed. They're quite biased, but can give you also quite details, feedback forms. And most of all, any support text. Trust on that. Support text is a great thing. They come up with problems, with questions, or every single support thing give you a bit of an insight where a gap exists in your product experience. Wonderful feedback. But don't limit yourself with these ones on, on, on customers. Talk to internal folks like marketing or sales team. They're often very close with their customers and can give you good insights as well. The only element which I marked here, Red, which I try to avoid are group sessions. Group sessions are a terrible idea because if you really want to get to the pain points, you need emotions. You need to be able to understand and have that person opening up about the things they struggle with or difficult and give you a bit of context. None of that is possible in group session where you have one of, where you present and can do maybe a couple of polls. People rarely open up because you're exposing your ideas to other companies and they're not really happy. Doing in a one-to-one -one session, they are much more open because it's private and focused. So again, feedback comes in many forms. Use all of them. Bring all of that into the scalable process set, get a full text and put it all in this one system so you can have more data points to link. Next, it's about the importance, the rating. You get a lot of feedback in this comes. You get, for example, interview with Mary that tells feature X is very important, but an email from Tom say, this is critical, but feature Y is, is not as much important. So you get these different data points. And we have two ways to identify relevance. On the one hand side, often systems have, um, for example, if this is presented, they have portals where people can rate on certain features and say, yes, I love that. Like, aha, I have a portal and say, yeah, I like that. The other one, I don't. So you get direct support and you can vote. From the emails, you can deduce this. Typically from the language, they use terminologies, mission critical, are really desperate, and you can deduce the relevancy. And you can use that in order to rank your feedback. Every single bit of feedback should be ranked accordingly, even if you make a gut feel. Of the sum, you're probably right. Typically, we recommend you have four categories. Not important. Very important to say, simply, this is useless. It's not important. This is a really good indication that if you may, people don't want that, then you have nice to have, importance, and critical. That really understand how their relation is to the business process. So rating is good. And the other, one, the other one is how many feedback points you get. How many active human beings told you that? The more versus the less, a group that has a lot of feedback count versus where few people have said that, give you an indication of importance. And you can gather that into a single score to make it easy for digest, similar to a RISE score that helps you inform RISE and the product prioritization. But again, some comes from voting, some from direct or indirect, where you have to deduce it. But together, they form a really nice picture, which pain points or feature in this case, bubble to the surface and should are worth your attention. When to collect feedback? That's a really interesting question. Because now we extended the scale from just not only custom interviews, which you need to schedule and just rare, but other sources like support tickets. I made a challenge myself that I should review in, uh, feedback almost on a daily basis. Get whatever comes in, go through as many as you can, and just with a proper tool, it becomes easy. You read it, you tag it to the pain points, and it's getting trend. It's like a fun game that every day you understand more about your customer. And you see also changes and trends. If something new comes up, a new feature is released, you see changes the way feedback is collected. So short answer, try to do it as often as possible. And always remember, in order to build, build good products, you need to run this feedback and collection, this voice of customer analysis, about three months before your project. Three months, you start this process. So when the project actually starts and you start writing your stories, 
you have this knowledge base, you have this database ready to say, this is important, it's not important. And I believe this is important because of these and amount of feedback. And you can deep into that feedback, you can know exactly what was said about a feature, helps you to start a very rich discussion with your team because you can show them the true pain points of the customer that with the after even in a video. Very powerful to get empathy and to get your PPA aligned. The other thing here, which is quite interesting, is around the shift from a feature to an experience perspective. This is a very simple employee journey. We don't know, don't need to go in detail, but it's all about employee getting a new job, get a bit of reflection, learning new skills, and maybe get a promotion after a network was built. Think about it. There's an ATS, a recruitment system dimension. You could have interviews just focused on that. Then there's a learning development component of e-learning and some career discovery. And all is umbrella in the red reporting because everything is important for the report. In the past, you would have done Recruitment would have done interviews and just stored it around that. Reporting would have done something and stored in a reporting to me. But you're shifting over to a single system where everything comes together. You can see that reporting already captures information that are relevant for ATS, for the career, and for the learning. So each domain, if they really do voice of customer, capture feedback from various dimensions and particular from other domains. And if they're all stored in one place, they can be shared, reused, and really working together as a team collector switch insights. Again, scalability comes, you're not doing it alone by working together. And that's why you need to go wide. So what can we take away from this? The employee-centric discovery, product, customer discovery, really needs a culture change and takes time. Because we can see with the, with the process, with the flow, it takes time to go up to the slope and level. We're not quite there with the product the plateau of productivity. But we need to know that we're stepping in the right direction. How to get started? First thing I recommend, start with your own research. You're the person who needs the feedback from customer most urgently. So you are the person who might need to make a change. Start with your own customer research. Take a tool, as I said, whatever you find, product board, dovetail, or even a homemade system, where you can link one piece of feedback to multiple problems. Try to do that and see the difference. Even if you're on research and you bring other people around, once they see the data, once they see how much research you collected and how easy it is, they will adopt and you can collaborate. As I said, use tool to automate and scale. Get to the raw data, get the extraction, make it searchable, and link it up. And the more tool, the earlier you start using tools, rather a flat confluence page, the better you are. This is not something you can do in a Google Doc sheet. You need to have proper tool. And then the key is share, share, share. Share with your team, share with your leadership, get this information, out. not to prove that you're wrong, but to spark a conversation. Or is that what it really means? Get, a couple, get so many points of feedback and let them judge that if your assignment of the problem space, if your understanding is correct. But by making the raw data available, they can make their own judgment. It can help you refine yours. As I said, the key here is really go wide, focus on the entire journey, loosen yourself. You're not doing research on a particular button or a particular feature. You're talking about the customer and what they do. Ask them how they do their business and where their breakpoints are. The journey is everything that matters. That's why you need to go wide and always look back on past feedback because everything gives you a bit of better understanding where you are. So, and then you're done? Unfortunately, not. This is a very similar, a very nice example how to illustrate it. This is actually the end of a hiking path up here in New Zealand. And at the end, you have a sign, you've done it, you reach the end. But if you keep going, you're going to be rewarded with a wonderful landscape and you're actually going to be surprised by the wildlife you find there. And it's similar to the customer discovery. That's not the end. You start this process and if you get going, this model will evolve and you're getting more and more data. But you keep, have to keep going on almost on a daily basis because customer pain points evolve. You always learn something new and, and you find it so much easier to share that knowledge. This is a communication tool by its heart to help bring engagement and motivation to you as well to your team, particularly if you're working and try it, because they are finally no longer away from the customer, can, can hear the voice of the customer directly and understand why their work matters. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'd love to talk to you more in the future. Thank you.